Hi, how are you? It's me, Dex, Dex Gelfand. And uh, mostly I talk about my practice of therapeutic spiritual counseling. Sometimes I talk about other related subjects of the mind and spirit. Sometimes I talk about uh, what I know from my background in Scientology and what I've observed about that. And uh, in this case, this is going to be a little bit of a different talk. In this particular talk, I'm speaking to those who are indoctrinated in Scientology, especially Scientology auditors. And if you don't have familiarity with this, a lot of what I say is going to be uh, unintelligible for you. But Scientology auditors are the practitioners, uh, the counselors, the people conducting the Scientology sessions. And that's about as much time as I'm going to spend trying to translate the terms. So what I'm calling this talk, what the title of this talk is, will be Scientology Tech Assertions from Hubbard that auditors are indoctrinated to fervently believe in, it's just not true. <laughs> That's my point on each of the points I'm going to cover. I've got a short list. And in each case, what I'm saying is Hubbard says this, and it's just not true. So let's start with the first one, very basic. The state of clear, quote unquote. Okay. Now the truth is, there is no generic uniform uh, objective uh, as described anywhere in Scientology or Dianetics, state of clear. I'm not saying that nothing good ever happens through uh, any of the techniques of Dianetics or Scientology. Uh, there are times when good things do happen. Some Occasionally, sometimes some very good things can happen. I'm not saying that it's worth the whole Scientology experience. You know, I'm not saying that it's worthless, but in general, quite a bit of what you're indoctrinated in, it's just not true. It certainly doesn't live up to the promises. It certainly doesn't live up to uh, the expectations you're given. I don't think there can be much argument about that. Anyway, the state of clear, first defined in uh, what uh, Scientology or Hubbard calls book one, which was... Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health. Uh, this was really more theory than, uh, than fact. But uh, I, I think Hubbard may very well have believed in what he was saying at that time in the book. You know, but it was theory. The idea that you have a, a container called the reactive mind where all your... Uh, uh, unpleasant feelings and attitudes are encapsulated within. And, you know, through these techniques, you just empty that tank out. There really is no such container or thing as the reactive mind. There are little individual uh, spiritual architectures of uh, ways of reacting to fear and pain. And uh, what we do with and about that, how we hold it in place by resisting it and develop protective attitudes around it, which just make it harder to simply process and techniques for trying to penetrate that, okay? But there is no actual uh, separate mind uh, called the reactive mind. And there is no real state of clear. In the Dianetics book, uh, the definitions described as homo novice, you know, new man, you know, with uh, such abilities as uh, uh, never getting ill, and perfect eidetic memory and other things. And when these things were tested, they actually fell flat on their face. One uh, famous and notorious uh, uh, incident of this was when Hubbard was on a stage, I believe this was 1952, uh, where he uh, brought on the stage to, for his audience to see someone who had supposedly gone clear. It was a woman. <laughs> and... Uh, so to demonstrate her superior abilities, he turned his back to her and said, tell the audience the color of my tie. And she couldn't remember that. So that's just, there's so many examples. But let's start with that basic. You know, later on through the years, this supposed state of clear was redefined and redefined always in the direction of uh, vague, always in the direction of 
defying any objective criteria. And uh, it became sort of a, a, <laughs> a debacle, you know, at, at one point around 1979, 1980. It went back and forth through the years even before that, saying, you know, originally the, the, the Dianetics book said you people were achieving the state of clear, could and were doing it through the Dianetics techniques in the book. Later on, Hubbard claimed, well, we found out that you need to do more, more Scientology to get that. More time, more money, more processes, more techniques. You know, you might, uh, we might construe that as a sales pitch and a, a way of uh, public relations for all the people that found that they never really got that result of being clear whether or not they were told they did or asserted they did. They did not maintain that, uh, that state of, you know, absolute peace of mind and presence uh, as described. And so, well, the answer was, well, you know, there's, we didn't actually uh, get all the way there with Dianetics. You need to do these other processes, these other techniques and and so forth, you know, and, and the definitions got watered down through the years. And, uh, and of course, always in the direction of, you need to spend more time and more money with us to get there. And there was always the idea then uh, in, well, in 1966, Hubbard came up with uh, what he called the uh, operating Thetan, okay, OT. And so that was supposed to explain all the things that uh, didn't occur for you on supposedly achieving the state of clear was, oh, well, you'll arrive at that point somewhere on the OT levels of whatever ability or state of being that uh, was should have occurred or was expected to have occurred in the state of clear. But interestingly, also the state itself, at one point, Hubbard went back and said that actually people had gone clear on Dianetics. And of course, there was a rush of people uh, going through the Scientology procedures to quote unquote verify and get acknowledged for having gone clear. And then it got even more ridiculous with, then he decided that some people were just always clear, you know, <laughs> if they spent all the money on auditing, on Dianetics or whatever. And then there was a rush of people uh, uh, you know, through the Scientology uh, testing procedures, they were clear. And then the pendulum swung back the other way. And, and uh, oh, no, you need to spend a lot more on Dianetics. Turns out you're not clear. And the definition changed to a person who no longer has his own reactive mind. Very tantalizing. What does that mean? They have somebody else's? Well, that was what he was implying eventually that, oh, sure, you're clear. When you're clear, you're clear. But all that stuff in you, all those things you still feel, those, those anxieties and those misbehaviors and those attitudes and those problems that supposedly a clear wouldn't have, that's because you're infested with all these other uh, alien beings that are infesting your body, and it's their feelings and attitudes affecting you, not your own. You're clear. And... Yeah, well, a lot of Scientologists bought into that and went on to do the quote-unquote upper levels uh, chasing those things. You know, I could talk a lot more about that, but uh, for right now I want to come circle back to the particular things that are indoctrinated in Scientology auditors that are just not true specific examples. So I wanted to start with all about that state of clear. You know, which only results in people having anxieties about everybody else seems to have actually made it, but them, but or it doesn't. None of this works at all, and it's all a sham. And how does one deal with their cognitive dissonance that they've invested themselves so thoroughly in something to the point of taking a sort of a condescending attitude towards those who aren't in the know as Scientologists? And uh, it's kind of a deep hole to try to find a way to crawl out of with the concerns about saving face and and confronting the fact that I've made a horrible mistake, all of that. Anyway, all of that aside, next subject I want to take up is uh, what's called listing and nulling, okay? And you're never supposed to ask a who or what question, 
unless you're doing that specific procedure, because supposedly this could result in tremendous uh, charge, you know, tremendous disturbance in the being if uh, they don't get the right who or the right what. Well, it's just not true. I can't tell you how many times I've asked who or what questions and there's never, ever been any, any disastrous results or even bad results. And I think that while it is possible occasionally for that to happen, I mean, just in life, if somebody asserts something about you that's just not true about you, you're this, you're that, or this is your problem, that can feel very aggravating, you know. But in Scientology, there's this indoctrination that, you know, if you're, if you're given a quote-unquote wrong indication, a wrong item, well, then you can just go kind of crazy, you know. So there's really that is way, way exaggerated and overplayed to the point where it, it's one of those, one of several things where, where Hubbard said, it's incredibly dangerous to violate this. It's just not true, okay? Next point, the danger, supposed danger of running Dianetics on people who have attested the clear already. I'm not going to say clears, well, clears, but there are no clears. But so let's just say people have attested to clear the danger. Uh, you could totally wreck a person by running Dianetics on them if they no longer have their quote unquote reactive mind. Well, what happened was at a certain point, Hubbard seems to have come obsessed with the idea of these alien body thetan spirits inhabiting one's soul and being the source of all their discomforts and bad feelings and attitudes. And so once uh, in following the Scientology bridge, somebody got through that state of clear, then supposedly they were totally exposed to all these horrible things. So then it went out uh, with the idea that this was promoted and said that you're in terrible danger when you're clear. It went from being the most wonderful thing in the world to being a very dangerous place to be because as quickly as possible, you got to go through those OT levels through the point of what's called OT3. You know that it's a very uh, dangerous place to be between the state of clear and OT3. So think about that. You got into this subject, you read the Dianetics book about achieving this remarkable, fabulous, beautiful, state of existence called clear. And then by the time you go through all the changes and reasons why it doesn't happen that way, it doesn't happen this way, you got to do this, you got to do that. But then when you get there, then you're told, oh, you're in the non-interference area. There's a very tricky spot and you've got to, you're in danger. You've got to quickly out of that state of clear and up through this OT3 state. Well, isn't that just a little bit of a bait and switch? And that's just not true. Okay, whatever you may or may not have achieved and then had it labeled as the state of clear, that isn't dangerous. If you've had any gains, any improvements or, you know, whatever uh, you've gained, that doesn't put you, as they say in Scientology about the state of clear, at risk. <laughs> that, I think, is just another public relations marketing uh, ploy to get people to shell out the big bucks for the confidential OT levels. Hubbard himself, before deciding this was true, had published quite a bit of technical bulletins about how to run Dianetics on clears and OTs. And all these case histories of exactly what happened and what he did in these sessions, okay, that was part of what you studied in the tech volumes. At least I know I did how to run this and running running Dianetics and OT3s was an everyday thing. It had to be done, of course, in an advanced organization because they were familiar with the confidential materials, which brings us to another, it's just not true. But let's just say, stop at this one for one moment to say, there never was a particular specific danger, particular to running Dianetics on people who have attested to clear or done a Scientology OT level. 
But when that came out, which was about 1978, you cannot, don't ever, you're forbidden to run Dianetics on clears. You know, it's bad for them. It doesn't work for them. And all these horrible things can happen. Uh, you know, part of the phenomena of everybody deciding or feeling or wishing or asserting that they were already at this super advanced state of being, which people tend to do in all spiritual practices to want to uh, assert being better than everybody else. In other spiritual circles, it's described as I'm an old soul. You know, it's basically the same idea. You're a a above the regular people. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's how this uh, applied to Scientology was that uh, every time it was a change where people could be allowed to attest to clear where they couldn't before, there'd be an onrush. I knew I was clear the whole time, but was particularly funny to me were the people for whom didn't get much benefit out of Dianetics. And there's reasons why you wouldn't. I've gone into that in other places. It's not perfect. There's a lot of things that are incorrect about this theory of incidents being the cause of things and about going earlier in incidents, always directing that mind earlier, which is not necessarily where your spiritual compass would naturally go. And it's not necessarily the answer. Dianetics has some uh, misleading principles involved in it anyway. But what I'm getting to is that everybody who didn't run well on Dianetics and have a lot of success started asserting, well, that's, I knew it because I was clear. That's why. I was above it. <laughs> Another way of asserting, I'm an old soul. I'm one of the higher spirits, you know, and so forth. So to me, that, that was funny that... Um, that became something that people could take that way. But there never truly was any particular danger uh, running Dianetics on somebody because they were clear or OT. Never happened. Again, Hubbard had published quite a bit of uh, HCOBs talking about his success in running Dianetics on clears and OTs. So it's just not true. And in that vein, continuing from there, the danger of running power processing on clears, on people who were tested to clear. Well, that's just not true. And I know because I have run power processing on people who were tested to clear and people who were tested above that to OT levels literally hundreds of times. Power processing, I think, is one of the most valid techniques in Dianetics and Scientology. And I'm going to cover that a bit more as we go forward. But first of all, it was completely false that there's anything dangerous about running that technique on people who attested to having ascended to the level of clear or attested to having ascended to some OT level above clear. Again, I have done this hundreds of times with people Back like 10 years ago, around that time period, um, especially, but several years going forward after that as well, never ever had any of these cataclysmic bad results, or any bad results, ever. So that's just not true, that you couldn't or shouldn't, or that it's dangerous to run power processing on clear zero T's. There is nothing to that. Next, in the same vein now with power processing, you can only run power processing once. It's dangerous and destructive to run it on a person more than once. Well, firstly, when power processing first came out, if you listen to the recorded lectures of John McMaster, who took the lead in developing power processing in 1965, you will see where he explains that at that place in time, in 1965, in uh, East Grinstead in St. Hill, that when you arrived at that time, you got power processing when you arrived, and then you got it a second time before you left. So there was a period where everybody was getting it twice. So it was so dangerous, how come nobody ever suffered from it? Never happened. And secondly, I've run the power processing, processing, excuse me, technique on the same person 
once, twice, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times, uh, tailoring it to, to whatever was coming up next for the person in their mind as something to address. And again, with not a single bad result ever. It's funny because I remember having a discussion about this with a friend who was a class eight auditor, very experienced class eight auditor and a very good guy, by the way. And he was just so adamant. It's, you know, it's a fluke that it worked out. Anytime it worked out is very dangerous. I'm saying the basis here that you're not seeing is you are arguing theory. You're arguing only because it says so and because you say it made sense to you. Well, when did you read something Hubbard said and ever decided it didn't make sense to you? It's not allowed. Your word cleared out of it. <laughs> we won't go into the whole uh, misuses of word clearing uh, as something, as a tool to uh, indoctrinate somebody that the only way out of a disagreement with anything Hubbard said is to find a way to agree with it <laughs> through word clearing. Uh, but uh, that argument just stayed with me, how, how indoctrinated uh, a, a person can become in their Scientology training to the point where I can say, but I'm explaining to you that literally hundreds of times I ran power processing on people more than once and on people who were clear or OT without ever getting a bad result hundreds of times. And your argument is it says so here that it's not valid and that makes sense to you and it's dangerous and it shouldn't be done. And I'm giving you facts, actual experience, experiential information, hundreds of cases. And you're holding your ground because you're so invested in believing what it says and finding a way to agree with it and being unchangeable about that. Well, it's just not true. Okay. And uh, uh, the next subject I want to cover here and the last subject is the secret confidential training information about power processing itself. Because what Hubbard says in those confidential things, outside of how to run it, well, actually, even the way he says to run it is not the best, but it's just not true. All these complicated, and I read them. I have all that. I have all the confidential stuff. It's not hard to get hold of. You know, it's... All those explanations are incredibly misleading. It's just this simple. You want to understand power processing? Well, it's very simple. It is essentially 1951 effort processing. That's what it actually is. Effort processing, if you don't know, is get the effort, okay, that the effort of some feeling, attitude, emotion, sensation, pain, get that effort of that and then get the counter effort, okay? Get the effort, get the counter effort. So what we would call counter effort, a simpler term is resistance. Get the energy you're putting out to resist that feeling, okay? And you're processing that by following those commands. Get the effort, allow yourself to digest, to process that energy of that feeling, and then get the counter effort which is very important, by the way, processing your resistance. Get the counter effort within you of, of how you've pushed back, how you've tried to prevent or deflect that undesirable fear or pain or whatever it is. Just get the effort, get the counter effort. Get the effort, get the counter effort. That was 1951 effort processing. It showed up uh, in... Uh, later in Scientology as to be used as sort of an assist for an injury. But uh, I don't know where Hubbard got that from. I have no doubt he didn't come up with it by himself based on what I know, how he worked and what was going on and where so many things came from. But, you know, it's just not true, by the way, that Hubbard uh, by himself created or developed Scientology. The very little processes or techniques I know of that I have not since been able to trace to coming from someone else. So it's not true, by the way, that he did that. But the point I'm on right now about power processing is all those explanations and those confidential HCOBs 
about the mechanics of power processing? No, it's just simple 1951 effort processing. Now, if you've studied power processing, you know there are six techniques or processes, but only one of them is the real, true, original power process, and that's called the conditions process. All the other processes or techniques, and this is explained again if you listen to John McMaster's lectures, were developed uh, as uh, to set a person up to run the conditions process. None of which were necessary, by the way, for most of us, although some of them were interesting processes, not necessarily invalid uh, in their own right. Okay, but the basic conditions process, power processing, is effort processing. It goes like this. Tell me an existing condition, and then how have you handled that? How have you handled that doesn't mean how have you resolved it. If you resolved it, you wouldn't be processing it now. It wouldn't be there. And it's not meant that way. It's meant, how have you reacted to that? How have you attempted to solve it, to deflect it, to resist it, okay? In other words, what has your counter effort been? So you're getting the effort of whatever existing condition comes to mind. Obviously, an existing by existing condition is meant some undesirable negative feelings or energy, some charge, okay? And then you get that effort in the question, tell me an existing condition. And then how have you handled that? How have you efforted back against that? It's just effort, counter effort. And all the other explanation of what's going on or how it works is nonsense. It just isn't true. But Hubbard liked to create this esoteric, above it all, mystical feel about things with going on about the supposed danger of doing things any differently than he said and uh, the explanations of the mechanics of how something like power processing works, which could not be more simple. I wouldn't even say it's worthy of being a course in itself because I just explained it in a few minutes during this talk. So all that confidential material about power processing, the mechanics of it and so forth, it's just not true. And I'm speaking from having used these techniques as I've just explained. I'm not speaking from theory. <laughs> In Scientology, you're speaking from theory. You're speaking from what it says here. <laughs> so that's the point. And there are other points I could bring up. But if you take anything from this, it's look at something objectively. Just because it's asserted by L. Ron Hubbard doesn't mean it's true. And for the purposes of this talk, we won't go into why would he lie? What would his purpose be? Let's consider that another subject for now. But what's important here is simply to understand that you need to observe for yourself and not be so invested as to submit your free will and inspection and thought as you had been indoctrinated in your Scientology training to accept without question, to go through this process you go through of Scientology indoctrination Wherein, if you're not agreeing with what you're reading, you feel like it's your responsibility and your duty to find your way to agree with it. Because that's what you are indoctrinated into doing in your Scientology training. And that's just wrong. That's it for this talk. I have many more videos, uh, some about other aspects of Scientology, but more importantly, about what does work and the principles of the spirit and mind that are useful and helpful to understand and to apply in what I call therapeutic spiritual counseling.